Hello, and welcome back to Technology Now, a weekly show from Hewlett Packard Enterprise where we take what's happening in the world and explore how it's changing the way organizations are using technology. We're your hosts, Aubrey Lovell and Michael Bird. In this episode, we are meeting somebody who says she didn't think she was any good at maths at school before falling in love with STEM studies at college and going on to become a NASA rocket scientist. In fact, she is soon going to be heading into space herself. Nice. But Aisha Bao's story is in no way typical of people who study the STEM topics as science, technology, engineering, and maths, because the number of graduates who have come from STEM subjects remains relatively low. Just over a quarter of university graduates in the UK have studied a STEM course, and in the US, it's less than one in five. That's according to research from the market analytics firm Statista. So why are the numbers so low? when the potential is so high? What can be done to encourage the next generation to explore more? And how can organizations get on board? I feel like we need to make this next part a jingle, but you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> if you're the kind of person who needs to know why what's going on in the world matters to your organization, this podcast is for you. And if you haven't yet, which you should have by now, please subscribe to your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out on all the great things we talk about. All right, Michael, are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. According to the UK Office for National Statistics, in 2022, people working in professional scientific or technical areas accounted for just 8.5% of the UK's working population. Meanwhile, in the US, the number is significantly higher. 24% of working Americans were employed in STEM occupations in 2021. According to the National Science Foundation, around 29% of men and 18% of women. But the disparity becomes greater when you break down the diversity of the workforce. According to those same statistics, STEM careers are poorly represented among the Black and African American communities, with just 18% of people overall working in STEM fields. Looking to change that and inspire more young people into STEM, whoever they are, is today's guest, Aisha Bo. She's a former NASA rocket engineer, entrepreneur, future astronaut, and STEM ambassador. She's also a member of the National Society of Black Engineers and the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Not bad for someone who didn't think she was any good at STEM subjects at school. Our reporter, Denise Morgan, recently had the chance to meet up with Aisha at an HPE-sponsored tech outreach day. So tell me about how we got to this point today. What got you into STEM? I was motivated to pursue STEM after studying in community college. I initially didn't think that I was good at math, and I didn't even know that I liked STEM fields, but I fell in love with math and science and pursued a career in aerospace engineering. I spent six years working for NASA, and I even operate my own engineering company where I have the opportunity to interact with aerospace topics and the STEM discipline every day. So you're a former rocket scientist turned speaker and entrepreneur, now with the mission to get kids into STEM. Talk me through how that became the mission. Being in community college, I didn't know what careers were available to me. I didn't know that math and science was exciting, and once I discovered the fields, I love them. I want to be able to bring the same joy that I have every day when I get up and work to the millions of people around the world who may not know that the very thing that they love to do is actually STEM. When I was working at NASA, I used to love to go into classrooms. I wanted to talk to students about what we were doing and how exciting space and science was. But when I would go into the classroom, they would look at me like I was an alien because they had not seen a female minority engineer with Caribbean heritage. And I was like, hey, we do exist. And more importantly, how can I make sure that not just your classroom, but the world gets to see themselves represented in this field. And for me, it's more than diversity. It's diversity of thought. It's bringing together the best people and the best minds to solve the problems that face our world, which include things like, how are we gonna get people to live on Mars? Now, what did you see as missing in the field that you wanted to change? What I saw was missing was the gap between industry and academia. I don't know about you, but my career was very different than what I studied. And I really didn't have any idea of how amazing it would be to be an aerospace engineer until my first day at work. And I remember that first day vividly. 
at the end of it, I was like, oh my gosh, those six years of college were actually worth it. And I think that that's too late. How do we bring the joy of the fields that we have every day into the middle school environment, into the elementary school environment, so that students can have an understanding of what they are and be inspired to pursue them? What are the main blockers to young people getting into sciences? I think there are three things that I like to focus on. Access, exposure, and opportunity. We know that genius is everywhere, but opportunity may not. And so for me, when I look at my role in today's world, it's how do I get out and provide access and exposure to the most number of students that I can possibly reach? And then how do I couple companies like HPE and the opportunities they have with the generation that could be part of the emerging workforce? So what can we as large tech organizations do to help overcome those challenges? As large tech organizations, I invite you to think about how you evaluate a student's potential. I often will share that I didn't start off as the strongest student. I graduated with a 2.3 from high school. I then went to college and I may not have been a student who would have made some of the early recruiting rounds. Let's just be honest. But today, I actually work with a lot of the companies that may not have hired me. And if we can move towards looking at whole people and more of a 360 approach to recruiting and retention, I think that we might end up with a more inclusive environment. Where do you think large organizations fall short in terms of making STEM careers look fun and rewarding to young people? I think that the stories are powerful. My invitation is to more brands and more people to take the power that's in their pocket and tell their story. What I love about where I'm at today is I can pick up the phone and if I'm having a down day, I can look at any of the number of women and companies that inspire me. As the In Her Element documentary that was produced by HPE showed, millions of people around the world watched the stories of three women who were in STEM because it was inspiring and it was a story that they may not have seen before. And that's the power of storytelling I think organizations should think about employee engagement efforts that allow for their employees to go into the schools, and also the efforts that allow employees to come and tour facilities where appropriate. It's difficult to come to a place and see a rover or see an astronaut or see a setting like this and go, wow, I'm not inspired. The more that can be done to put these real life role models the parents, the engineers, the employees who every day are making the technology possible in front of the student in the classroom, in partnership with the schools and the teachers, and to bring the students on site, that's transformational. So you obviously talk a lot about young people. What messages would they give to us as tech leaders? I think the message that they might give to tech leaders is we're more capable than you think. I often meet middle school students who astound me with how good they are with coding and the internet. I just talked to a middle schooler in sixth grade who is developing three games, three games. I don't even have an idea how to code one. He's redefining in real time my thought process when it comes to who at what age can do what. I think the invitation for all of us is to say, Why do you have to wait until you're graduated from high school to maybe go for an internship, right? Or maybe go and get a project that you can do with your high school that adds value. I think there are ways to engage students who are younger, earlier, and give them real things, not just projects. Let them contribute to programs and get their hands on technology at an earlier age. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much. And we'll be back with Aisha in a moment, so don't go anywhere. All right, then. It is time for Today I Learned, the part of the show where we take a look at something happening in the world that we think you should know about. Aubrey, what are we talking about today? So today we are taking a look at how students have used AI to read ancient scrolls for the very first time since they were buried and carbonized by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. A farmer found over a thousand of these scrolls in the 18th century when he was digging a well, although attempts to enroll and read them tended to destroy them. 
But technology has come a long way since the 1700s. And in 2019, a professor called Brent Seals imaged a number of scrolls found in the ruins of Herculaneum at the foot of Mount Vesuvius and a particle accelerator generating 3D CT scans at high resolutions. Try to say that 10 times fast. That revealed the markings of ink from a still rolled scroll, but no actual words were visible. And that inspired a team of experts to set up the Vesuvius Challenge in 2023, which offered more than a million dollars in prize money to anyone who could use computer technology to decipher what was written on those pieces of parchment. And in January of this year, the challenge announced on their website, which we've linked in the show notes, that three students had all deciphered words using AI. The team trained a machine learning model using the ink that had already been scanned. And the more they trained it, the more the model discovered more ink, which became visible as letters and eventually formed words. And what was the very first word read from a scroll in almost 2,000 years? Porfura, which means purple. Well, thank you so much for that, Aubrey. Awesome to see a coming together of the very ancient and the cutting edge. What are tech and STEM organizations currently doing well in terms of young people and young talent, or what should they keep doing? I think tech and STEM organizations are doing an amazing job taking a stand and stating their values. What I've loved over the last few years is that organizations like HPE say, we are for STEM, we are for inclusion, we want to cultivate the emerging workforce, we want to spur innovation, and these are the things that we're going to do it. And they're putting out roadmaps and they're allowing for other people like me and other organizations around the globe to say, I want to sign up to be a part of that mission. I would love it if even more organizations would follow that lead and say, we're all going to take a stand on the things that we think are important to create the future that we want to see. So is there anything career-wise we can do today that you wish was done when you were starting out? I wish that I had more career counseling opportunities earlier. It wasn't really until I got into college that the idea of a career was presented to me. In high school, it was more of like, pick a track, pick this thing that you can go into. But careers today, they're not fixed, they're evolving. They allow for you to make decisions that give you more options. And I would like to bring the modern idea of a career into middle school and into high school and have it not be something that you pick this one point and you stick with it forever, but it's the start of a journey. And that journey is your career. And over different decades in your life, you're gonna fill different roles. Maybe you're going to start up an entry level and you're going to go from this thing to that thing. But all in all, it's really going to be about you and the journey and the experience that you want to have to live your best life. So what's one simple piece of advice you can give to a young person to get them inspired in STEM? One simple piece of advice. That's a good one. One simple piece of advice that I would tell them is no matter what they want to do, that they can do it. As a young person, I had all of these dreams, but I struggled with confidence. And the advice that I would give is very simple, which is believe in yourself. You can and you will succeed. That is fantastic, Aisha. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Denise, for bringing us that interview with Aisha. And you can find more of the topics discussed in this episode in the show notes. Right, we are getting towards the end of the show, which means it is time for This Week in History, a look at monumental events in the world of business and technology which has changed our lives. Aubrey, what was the clue last week? So the clue last week was, it's 1935 and beep, 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 I see you. Ooh. Did you get it? I did not get it. I did not get it. Well, don't worry. It was a tough one this week. It's actually the first practical demonstration of radar or Ah, radio detection and ranging. Cool. Right? And the technology for using radio waves to detect things had been around since the late 19th century, but really couldn't go any further than saying, hey, there's something in the air. It was useful for weather reporting, but that was really about it. And that was a starting point for radar creator, Scottish physicist, Robert Watson Watt, who wanted to try and detect approaching thunderstorms with more accuracy, including tracking their direction, distance, and height. 
He quickly realized, though, that the technology worked well for spotting aircraft, too. And in a test in 1935, he used a powerful transmitter and receiver to track a bomber flying around the area with incredible accuracy, which saw Britain immediately buy into the system. And if that's not enough, developments designed to make better radar, such as transistors and microwave emitters, had their own revolutionary effect on our world. Next week, the clue is it's 1977 and things are about to get super. Can you guess what it is? I can't, Aubrey. There's a lot of possibilities there. Not sure. Possibilities. Anyway, well, tune in next week to find out if you are right. And that brings us to the end of Technology Now for this week. Thank you to our guest, Aisha Bo, and to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Technology Now is hosted by Aubrey Lovell and myself, Michael Bird. And this episode was produced by Sam Datapolin and Al Booth with production support from Harry Morton, Zoe Anderson, Alicia Kempson, Alison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri, Camilla Patel, Alex Podmore, and Chloe Sewell. And our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Now is a Lower Street production for Hewlett-Packard Enterprise, and we'll see you at the same time next week. Hold up. 